Gary, how are you? Are you missing me at this difficult time? <laughs> yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I sometimes complain and whinge on the way to matches. You know, when you've got to drive three or four hours, like Norwich or whoa, whoa, Southampton. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did you say sometimes? <laughs> no, I mean, you do, don't you? Some, you you've got those long five hours or you've got the trains at sort of, a, you know, 10 o'clock at night that get back in at half one in the morning and you, you think, oh, you're hard done to sometimes. You feel like the world's against you. And then you're in your moments like this and you just realise that you'd, you'd do anything to be back on the road watching football and doing normal things. It's, uh, it is unbelievable, this. One of the very few uh, upsides of this, though, because everybody is in the same boat as us, we can't go into the studios now, we can't broadcast in a normal way, is you get a great snoop around people's houses when you're on Skype in. I'm loving the decor. You've got a bit of David <laughs> Bowie gone in the background. What else you got there? What are those, what are those pictures of? The ones on the uh, shelf? That's, uh, it's actually Mick Jagger, Keith, Ri Keith Richards, and I'm not sure who the one is in the middle. I can't see that far. Just, I just something when I moved, I moved people, people, well, people might not know this, probably don't know this. I was, uh, well, they believe I was single, I think. I was signal, single in Manchester from the age of about 26 <laughs> to 29. And um, I actually went on a massive uh, photography binge in terms of just art and photography. Um, I used to just walk out in the afternoon and just loved artwork and got into it and collected a lot. And I've got, I don't know, I don't know if you can see, I, I, I should take you around in a bit if I can take you around and show you some of the artwork. I've, I actually am really proud of it. It's the one thing I've kept with me for 17, 18 years. I never have any artwork of football in my house or souvenirs or memorabilia or anything like that. But I do have, obviously, artwork of, of uh, that, I, that I like in photography. So it's something that I actually am passionate about. I mean, I, I've been fortunate to uh, to be, I've been in your house. Uh, not that you very, invited very, me. Very, very fortunate, very fortunate. <laughs> your, your wife did. And, and outside of football, your passions are uh, music and art, aren't they? And buildings. Yeah, I love, I love, um, I love artwork. I've, wherever I've been on a holiday, wherever I've been in the world, I've always bought a piece of art from wherever I've been. Um, it can be a small thing, it can be a little sculpture, it can be a little um, drawing, it can be a sketch, it can be anything. Um, and I've always just done it and just always brought it back and hoarded it and just ended up putting it up on the walls everywhere and just putting it around places. So it's something that I am passionate about, yeah. Yeah, I've got a nice Spanish donkey in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, if you, during these... Uh, Seriously, uh, difficult time. Have you, have you got have you got trophies on your back shelf there? What are they for? <laughs> uh, uh, behind me, uh, I've got I've got a couple of my favourite books or a few of my favourite books there. I think you see I've got, uh, Alan Smith. I've got Heads Up, a book by Suey, and a book by Cara. Just interesting have you, reading. Have you got a vinyl collection there at the bottom as well? Yes. Can you see that? Yeah. I keep, yeah, I, keep I can all, see that. Yeah. Some of my vinyl down here. I keep, you know, I, I do like my vinyl. So that, I keep all that. That, that takes me back you know to the John Moss. Do you know John Moss, the referee? Did you know John Moss, the referee? He's got a, a vinyl shop in Leeds called The Vinyl Countdown. Big vinyl man, John. I didn't know that, but I do remember when I was younger on a Sunday afternoon that we'd go into the front room. We had a big, so they lived in a, a, a two up, two down terrace, and we lived in the back room, obviously, which was the kitchen dining. And then in the front room, which we'd never go in, we only go in on a Sunday afternoon, and the, uh, and it would be Abba or Shawadi Wadi, basically playing on playing on vinyl on a Sunday afternoon with a Kentucky a Kentucky Fried Chicken takeaway, which is the only takeaway shop near us at the time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, simple pleasure, son. Simple pleasure, son. <laughs> now I, I I'm not entirely sure I follow the next bit because um, the producer said, look, uh, we can't get together. So we need a bit of off script. We need something to talk about because understandably there is the focus is on the important things, which is pe people's health. And we're all in lockdown at the moment. And by the way, once again, let me join everybody else. Fantastic. What you and Ryan and your partners have done with the hotels. Brilliant, brilliant gesture. Um, they need a bit of distraction, a bit of levity, a bit of entertainment. I said, yeah, okay, I get that. What, what should we do? Cause you and I've done countless interviews. He said, ring him and ask him about his time at Valencia. Now, I can see why that could amuse a lot of other people, but I'm not entirely sure that's going to lift Gary's spirit. I mean, as soon as they even say the word Valencia, what do you think? 
Uh, massive lesson um, in terms of allowing probably a number of things really. One, sometimes no is a great word. Uh, and I think saying no to the original offer probably from Peter when he asked me to do it uh, with such obviously short time frames to react from it and probably thinking that... But that's, that's Peter Lim, your business partner. He's your partner of a number of different things. And it, it was a very different scenario. It's not the, like a, a chairman of a club now ringing you up and saying, Gary, no. we'd like to speak to you. This is, is a, a close personal friend and also a business associate. So you probably viewed the request in a completely different fashion to uh, being offered a job in football, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I turned down two Premier League uh, inquiries and two Championship inquiries in probably the 18 months before. I, I had no intention to go into management. Um, and obviously I was working as a coach under Roy, but I was doing more of the video work with Roy and Roy and Ray were doing the coaching and I was doing the more uh, analysis type stuff that I was doing on Sky. Um, and when Peter rang me, I just felt that he'd supported me and the lads in obviously Salford in other business ventures. And, you know, he he, he didn't want to bring a manager in partway through a season because he knew that he wouldn't get the manager that he wanted. He didn't want to rip the squad up and him cost him a load of money. He wanted just somebody to navigate him to the end of the season that he trusted. And I said, I said no initially. I didn't think it was the right thing. But then eventually he obviously wanted to do it for him. So I think saying no and being and sticking to where you, you are, but I think also a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of ego. I think at that point, if you remember, I'd lived through Manchester United for 20 years. I'd gone to Sky and it had gone well. And you feel a little bit unbreakable. You feel a little bit sort of uh, in a position where you uh, nothing's going to go wrong. And when you're unprepared, you're not working as hard as, at something as other people are when you take something on that you're not qualified in or not as qualified in as you should be, then you get a slap round the face. And to be fair, when I look back now uh, at some of the decisions that I made, the initial decision, obviously, but then the decisions that I made when I got there, it was a massive learning for me. I think it's helped me even in the last couple of weeks in respect of what's happened with this crisis in my businesses and, and the hotels and the football club. I now act far more decisively. I now act far more definitely than I've ever acted before because of Valencia, where, to be fair, I fluffed around a few decisions that I should have made and I knew instinctively at the time that I should have made big decisions and I didn't do. I sort of thought I could get away with it and get it to the end of the season and just, you know, steer the ship home to the sand and let someone else take it back out to sort of see again. But it just never happened like that. I got a massive bloody nose. Well, when... When you say it was uh, e ego driven and overly confident, did you only recognise that in hindsight? At the time, did you think, well, hang on, you know, I'm, I'm analysing football every week. I'm analysing football for Roy Hodgson. I had a 20 year career at one of the biggest clubs in the world, a hugely successful time. Was it a case of thinking, well, I've seen how all the components work. Can't be that difficult to put it all together and not appreciating the difference between theory and practicality. I think there was, I think that uh, because I'd never done it before, I underestimated the difference between being a player, being a coach under a manager, and then being the manager itself. I, under, I underestimated how difficult it would be in a different, uh, a different league, in a different uh, city, in a different country and the language barriers. I underestimated the size of the job that was actually I was about to take on. I knew it was going to be difficult because the, the results weren't great. And I'd been told by my brother who was over there that the dressing room was struggling. But there's the scale and size of it. The only way I can describe Valencia in terms of a sort of hotbed of football, it's a little bit like uh, Liverpool. It's a little bit like Newcastle. It's like a, a ferocious city in the sense that it's, it's fans... If they take you in, they'll love you forever. But if they don't take you in, they're going to be quite difficult with you quite quickly. And um, I think that the ego in me said that I could handle anything. I could do anything. I could uh, take anything on. That was a confidence. That was a, a, a belief I had, which is good. But then you've got to have that perspective and that awareness of, hang on a second, am I really 
up to this? Have I done this before? Is this really the first job you're going to take in football? Valencia, you don't speak the language, you don't know the league, you don't know the away grounds, you don't know the referees, you don't know the, the local media, you don't know the national media. You're a, you're a stranger in a city that, to be fair, doesn't expect you to come. All those things I underestimated and it was my ego that felt I could get through anything and just take it in my stride that, that, that made me probably, when I was over there, not realise how, not, not how difficult it was going to be. I don't think I saw the warning signs or the, 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 the flashing lights quickly enough. I think I, I probably should have seen the warning lights a lot quicker and gone in there in crisis mode rather than going in there thinking I could put it right straight away. When you look back now, can you see what those warning signs were, what those flashing lights were? Were there obvious moments oh. where you think, should, should, have, should have said that to him, should have done that, should have done that. So once you pass the point, of course, taking the job in the first place, that was an emotional decision, which, in fairness, knowing you, is not normally you. You don't normally make emotional decisions. OK, so if we move past that, what, and it, it, it almost doesn't sound like you, because you say you're, you're not, people, people don't know you personally, you are direct, you're, you are very, you can be brutal in the way you normally are. So when you say you, you were fluffing around and trying to sort of cajole it along, that, that's diametrically opposed to your natural character. Jeff, I plan everything in sort of three and five year batches. I know exactly what's going to happen in the next three years, next five years, what I want to get out of it. I've always done that, even in football with my career in terms of where I want to be. The two instinctive decisions that I've made in my life, which are Valencia and opening a nightclub in Manchester, which is obviously a very different thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that, that I could be a nightclub. nightclub but no, the two... no, it didn't, Jeff. The two the two instinctive decisions that I've made in my in my life in the last seven or eight years since football that have just been instinctive, not really a great deal of thought behind it, not a specialist in the industry, have failed. And you sort of have to go through those experiences when you sort of make those types of decisions and you haven't done the planning, you haven't done the thinking, you haven't got the right partners on board with you in terms of you obviously going to go into an industry. And when I talk about partners, obviously that could be the the the, the last thing that I the, the last thing that the staff needed in Valencia was an inexperienced manager. The last thing that I needed was an inexperienced staff. We just didn't need each other, but all the staff were inexperienced as well. But when I went over there, I went over there thinking that I was going to put this sort of framework in place for Peter to set him up for next season. So I introduced a whole new uh, data capture department with an analyst that I took over. I, I gave all the players iPads and wanted to sort of revolutionise the, the way in which we uh, consumed information. I wanted to set up meetings weekly with the sporting director and the academy director to ensure that the structures were in place beyond me being there so that the new manager coming in was going to you know, I even went to commercial meetings with the club's commercial directors about the club's branding and things like that. I, I wanted to look at it as a business. I wasn't there to look after the business. I was there to get basically the club, the first team, results to the end of the season. And I just completely approached it in the wrong manner. But from a, it, it, from a pure point of view, I was trying to do the right things. But I never dealt with what my primary role was, which was winning football matches quite quickly. Yeah, results. Results. It's, I will say, to, you know, to the managers, you guys are in the results business. I mean, the other thing I'm curious there, though, listening, Gary, is you again, you know loads of people in the game, but at that time, were you not listening to advice from the likes of Sir Alex and Roy Hodgson and other managers that you know? It's interesting. So one of the big early mistakes that I made was that a couple of senior players within the first couple of weeks came to me for, not, for not, nothing to do with myself. One was for wanting to move back to... Uh, where where his wife's family came from because there were family issues and the other play the other player had been receiving criticism from the fans, and they both had very strong influences in the dressing room and they both came to see me within the first couple of weeks and said that they wanted to leave, and at the time I I, I was of the opinion look when you're trying to get players out under uh, in a in a January transfer window because I went there in sort of mid December. Essentially, it's going to be a bit of a fire sale type thing if you're getting players out of that time. Let's try and keep the ship steady to the end of the season. And I should have made a couple of really big decisions on players that weren't committed to the club at that point, even though they were for the non-footballing reasons, uh, both of them. And I remember speaking to Sir Alex on the way home from training quite early on one day and him saying to me, just get rid of them, son. 
He said, don't even think about it. He said, protect yourself. Only have people in the dressing room who are facing the same direction as you. And that means you need to get results. And, so why and didn't you I, listen to him? Because I went, I went home and I went into training the next day. And I thought, I'm only here for four months. These were two... Uh, do you remember when Unai Emery said that he had five captains uh, uh, when, when he was Arsenal manager and he got criticised for it? Well, every I think every club in Spain or most clubs in Spain have five or six captains. So we had five captains at Valencia. These were two of the captains. They were two of the senior players. They were good lads. They didn't, no problem with them as people. They had obviously individual issues. And I tried to talk them round over a period of a week into accepting that, look, let's just stay here to the end of the season. At the end of the season... There'll be a new manager comes in. It'll be a lot more stable. You can make a decision in the cold light of day because it's a great club. So you can sort of get through these next four or five months. You're a big part of the squad. And started to talk to them in that nature. Um, but they weren't happy. Um, if you remember, um, there were a couple of other players who've been left out by the previous manager who are brought back in. And I, I, I did what, to be fair... Do you know when you hear managers come into a, a club and they do an interview? You'll have done thousands of these types of interviews, Jeff. And you hear the new manager say, look, everyone's got a clean slate. You start from scratch. Everyone that's had a previous history you know, get, gets pushed away. Well, I adopted that approach. But if you look at what Jurgen Klopp did at Liverpool with Ben Teke or what, Joe Hart, or what happened to Joe Hart with uh, Pep Guardiola, the minute, that, the minute that a manager goes into a club nowadays, he's just got to get the right people on the bus that are right for him, that are right for the club, that will get him results and he believes will... I went. I don't think the approach of everyone's got a clean slate anymore is actually because managers haven't got time to be able to give a year to a player to work out whether they're a good a good lad or not or a bad lad or not. You just got to be definite. And I just I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying, but there's a big part of me is that here's thinking, and it, 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 I can also hear it in your voice to a degree, albeit for the right reasons in your mind. You've ignored one of the greatest football managers ever's advice. Do, do, do you know what I did, Jeff? I, I looked at Sir Alex Ferguson in terms of, you know, I remembered the part of Sir Alex Ferguson that existed at Manchester United where he was incredibly loyal and kept a lot of players at the club for 10 years, 15 years, 8 years. I forgot the part that basically where he was brutal and he was clinical and made decisions that were, at the time, he felt right for the club that surprised everybody else on the outside and even us on the inside sometimes by players leaving in such a short... You know, I always remember sort of Mark, Mark Hughes, Andre Konchelskis and Paul Ince leaving one summer when we broke through and the kids broke through and it was a, there was uproar. And I, even I was shocked at the time as a, as, a, as a player thinking that he'd done that. And then obviously there were other players that left over a 10-year period, some of them very quickly and, and, and in a short period of time that surprised everybody. I almost remembered one part of Sir Alex Ferguson but didn't remember the other. And that day when I heard him speak on the phone, do you know what I think I thought to myself? I thought, well, that's easy for him to say because obviously he had the control and the authority to do that. But if I go in tomorrow and get rid of two captains, what will that do to the rest of my dressing room? What will it do to... The rest of the players who like those players, will, will they think that I'm just coming in here to make a, a statement and do something that's essentially quite an unpopular decision? And I went a little, I, I, I went weak. And I promised myself when I left Valencia that I would never go weak on a big decision again. And I would always be definite and I would always be clinical and I would always act decisively and quickly. And that's what Valencia taught me. I went weak for a period of, three, four months where I lost my confidence eventually, and I'll come on to that in a bit. I, I, I genuinely lost my confidence. I, I, went, I woke up in the morning not wanting to go to training. It got to the point where I didn't want to take training sessions. I actually handed it over to Paco, Ayeristan and Philip and the other coaches because honestly, I felt embarrassed in doing the sessions in broken English where I had to stop with the translator. That then had to be translated to the player. The player would then come back to the translator, it then come back to me. And I was actually, to be fair, losing my own will to live, let alone the players who were standing around waiting. And in the end, I just completely lost my confidence because I just, and my whole uh, life I've communicated well, I've been able to speak to people well, but the idea that I couldn't communicate to people, I couldn't get my message across, I was naive uh, in, in the decisions that I was making. Uh, meant that it just all came on top of me quite quickly. Were you stood there thinking, I can't do this because of the language barrier, I I, this is not working, I can't do this? Or were you actually stood there thinking, 
I can't do this. I'm not a football coach. I've found out in the worst possible circumstances, I cannot do this. What were you thinking? I, the, the, I think both. Um, I think that the... Uh, I wasn't thinking I couldn't do this because of the speaking language in the sense that I was doing four or five lessons a week. Um, but, do you know, when you've got four months in a job, you haven't got time to learn Spanish. I actually should not have even... I, I should have put the the Spanish lessons to the back burner and what I should have done was bring in two or three really exper experienced English stroke, uh, dual language speaking, English language... Um, that, that basically could do, essentially could do the job for me in in in, in a three four month period because I didn't have ch there was no chance that I was going to learn Spanish in four months even though I was trying my best and I was doing everything that I could and it was important that I committed so I took my family over I learned the language but the things that I the things that I knew before I went over there like I didn't speak the language I didn't know the league I didn't know the away grounds I didn't know the referees I didn't know the media I never looked at those as excuses because I knew those before I took the job. What I would say is in terms of did I think I wasn't a good coach, what I would say is that if I went into a coaching role in the future, which will never happen, but if I was to, I would go in there with the best in class coaches. What I do feel I can do is communicate to people and, and see a football match and understand a football match. But the ability to coach a football team of or a football squad of 22 players requires hundreds of hours of practice on the grass. And I didn't have the hundreds of hours of practice on the grass behind me. To be a football player at Manchester United for 20 years, I practised for thousands of hours playing full-back and practising being defender, being, a, uh, being able to pass the ball. To think then I could go and be a coach having not done any hours on the grass, because I wasn't doing that with Roy Hodgson. I was only doing the video analysis work mainly. That was just complete and utter naivety and arrogance. I needed to bring in three or four. You know, I had one or two already that were there, but I needed to bring in probably a couple of others, real specialists in coaching football teams to a philosophy that I wanted. And that's what I think Steven Gerrard's done up at Rangers. I think he's brought in really good quality coaches in around him. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's done it at Manchester United. Ryan Giggs, I've seen, obviously, I know, has done it with Wales. If you bring in high quality... Yeah, Alex yeah, Ferguson yeah, did yeah, it. Good, look. Yeah, look, I was going to say, look no further than the example that was in front of you for 20 years. He didn't do well, that much for the coaching, did he? No, Sir Alex never did any of the coaching on the grass, but he had fantastic coaches in Brian Kidd, Steve McLaren, Jim Ryan, Mick Phelan, Rennie Mullenstein, Carlos Queiroz. And they were the changing element of the Sir Alex Ferguson era, but they were all brilliant on the grass. Now, from that point of view, I, I went over there and in Spain, the coach goes onto the field. The coach goes on to the coaching pitch or the training pitch and he does the sessions. So I felt as though I had to go on the training pitch and do the sessions. And again, I should have just stuck to what I knew, which was I can read a game. I can deal with people, let other people coach the team and, and do the sessions and me pick up. Even if they had to do the actual, um, some of the team talks and the video analysis, because obviously there was communicating the language I couldn't have done. Um, I do genuinely believe the players liked me and the players wanted to do well for me. I don't think I lost the dressing room as such in terms of me as a person. I think I lost the dressing room maybe in the in the quality of the training sessions that I put on and the communication skills. Um, and that maybe then just wore them out a little bit. And I think ultimately it was just not setting it up. It was not setting it up right when I went there straight away. It was not understanding where my pitfalls were going to be and where my weaknesses were, which in every other part of my life... You know, the reason I used to give the ball to you know David Beckham or Cristiano Ronaldo is because they were better on it than me. I understood what I was as a football player. I was a server. I should have played the role as a, as a coach stroke manager that I could play at that time. And I didn't do. I tried to basically do everything. And, I, and it was just naive of me, really. There was the Real Madrid game early on where we could have won it in the last minute. There was a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, Rafa Benitez was manager of Real Madrid. I think he actually lost his job the next day, believe it or not. Um, but that was, a, a, it was an amazing night, that. It, we, we drew 2-2. The atmosphere was incredible. 
Um, it was out of this world in terms of being on the, you know, seeing Christian. Gary, uh, if, they, if, they're not, if they're not part of you, and I, I, I understand, and you have been, you're very honest about it, but is there a part of you that is proud that you have managed against Real Madrid? No. No, I don't. I, I never think of it. I mean, I've never think of, of anything that I've done and felt proud about it. I actually, what I remember about that game is that um, that obviously we were struggling in the league, and Real Madrid were absolutely outstanding. They had Bale, Cristiano Ronaldo, and all the other sort of great players, and we left the grass really long <laughs> on the pitch so that the ball wouldn't travel very quick, and we didn't water it either. And I remember Cristiano coming over to me. Honestly, it's a true story. He came over to me before the game. He said, Gaz, Gaz, a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Cut the pitch. Cut the pitch. I said, you've no chance of me cutting the pitch. <laughs> honestly, it was like a farmer's field. Honestly, it was. We left it that long. There was no, there was no way he was dribbling that night. <laughs> um, and he, but do you know something? At that point, I actually thought, well, if that's in the players' heads and it's in Cristiano's heads, that before the game this was... I thought that they're not. That, you know, I always knew when we were distracted before a game, maybe at United, the odd time where we thought maybe. I remember once at Bradford, the, the dressing rooms weren't big enough, and we all went out, and it was bo it was boiling hot, and we all went outside into the corridor before the game, about an hour before, and just sat in the corridor. And what we were telling Bradford were that the changing room wasn't good enough, so it probably lifted them a little bit. And I suppose that message from Cristiano that night <laughs> gave me a little bit of a a hope. But then there was another period part way through. Where I think we went, I think we won three games and drew two. I think we went like a little unbeaten run, including cup games. And we got the first league win. And I thought, here we go, we've got it now. We'll go on a good run. Um, that was a period where I felt as though we were starting to get there. The set, the tr Paco had come in. The training sessions had started to become a lot. You know, with, with Phil w had become a lot more smooth. The communication had become a lot more smooth. The players seemed to be responding a little bit. They knew that. We'd done quite a lot of fitness work with them in the early days and we were trying to get them fit. There were quite a lot of injuries at the time when I first joined. And the players were coming back from injury and we were starting to get quite good. And I could see the bones of a, a really good football team. And there were some really talented players. I mean, Gaia, Cancelo now who's at Manchester City, Gomez who was at uh, Valencia, um, um, uh, Paco Alcazar who, was at, uh, who went to Barcelona. Uh, Mustafi was there. We, we, we had five or six players that you could say were really sort of good players and some decent young players as well. And I just felt that we were getting there and things were improving. And then I think that's when the 7-0 came against Barcelona, probably a couple of weeks after that. And it started to get really bad quite quickly. You've, you're hugely experienced, even as a player. You're always comfortable doing media. Uh, you're always comfortable doing interviews and you were quite happy going on the front foot. You were quite happy to taking journalists on over here. How different was it and how different were the press conferences to what you were used to? J Jeff, honestly, um, I will stand in front of any camera and speak at any time and as many times as I have to. I've done that throughout my career. You know, when England got knocked out of the World Cup or European Championships, I'd show up, I'd, 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 I'd stand up and I'd do the press conferences and I'd, I'd spill my guts you're, out. You're, you're what we call in the media, you're, you're what we call a go-to player. Right, who's no, going to come out? They've yeah. just been done. Who will come out? Yeah, I mean, I always, if we lost, then I'd be the player that would go out and speak. And, or if it was, you know, with England, or if it was, you know, I'd be one of the players, that should I say. I was over there, I think I had 30 matches. And the rules in Spain are, as they are in, uh, in England, that you have to do a, a press conference the day before every game and obviously straight after the game, full press conference. Exactly the same. I was over there, I think, 120 days or 130 days, something stupid like that. And I did 60 press conferences. I don't, I don't, know, if people, I don't know if people will remember, they won't remember. We did not, because we were in the Copa, uh, the Copa del Rey and the, uh, and the uh, Europa League to the point whereby I left, we had a game every midweek whilst I was there. So we played Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday. We didn't have one single free week from the moment I arrived until the moment that I left. And that was one of the other big mistakes that I made that Peter rang me up about January, mid-January and said, 
um, other than the Christmas break, which everybody had. So basically, every time we played a game, we had a game three days later, every single game. So there was never any training time at all, which was one of the big frustrations because we just felt I just felt like we needed to jump off the roundabout that was spinning and just rest and give the players a couple of days off. And what I should have done, actually, was probably give the players two or three days off and said, turn up for the game on Wednesday just to give them a break. But I didn't do I always went through the same routine. But what Peter said to me in mid-January was, look, Gary, get out of the Copa del Rey, get out of Europa League. It's the league that's the priority. That's the, that's the competition that's killing, us, that's killing us. And we kept on winning in the Europa League and the, and the, uh, and the Copa del Rey, obviously, until the semi-finals and the quarter-finals. Um, but we just had no energy at the weekend and the pressure was building every single weekend. And with Salford over the last five years... I've always said the FA Trophy or whether it be the Manchester Senior Cup when we're in the lower leagues, they're not the priority. Forget about them. We deal with the league. That's our priority. And even Sir Alex, when we was younger and you know he put the kids into the sort of Carling Cup teams or the League Cup teams and he played the, 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 the main team in the Champions League and the Premier League. You know, I'd, I'd been surrounded by this all my life in terms of Salford or Manchester United. And again, just a really weak decision not to play the kids in a game in the Europa League and Copa del Rey, get knocked out of the competition, take, take the initial what would be hit in terms of uh, criticism and then get to a priority whereby we had a week's recovery before each league game. So we just I just made a massive mistake with that in terms of priority. And it was a, the press conferences were relentless. Every single game, the questions were detailed. And I'm not being critical of the English press here. The questions were a lot more tactical, a lot more pointed, a lot more specific around why he did this in a game and why he didn't do that in a game. And if you actually didn't give them the right answer, you'd get a follow-up, which would actually chase it down the road with you. And you felt as though you were being questioned in terms of your understanding of the game and your tactical knowledge. And in the early... You've, you've, you've sorry to interrupt you, you you've worked with me for, for donkey's years and uh, colleagues, Pat and Laura. When we're interviewing managers, it's a different culture here. Prior to Pep Guardiola, um, why did you play Carl Walker uh, as a centre-back in, in a three as opposed to wing-back because of his pace? He's going to look at me and he's going to say, well, sorry, Jeff, can you just remind me, who did you play for? Who did you coach? Oh, Jeff, honestly, the questions that, uh, that coaches are asked over in Spain are a lot more... Um, almost pre technical, precise, and they hit you exactly where you don't want it. So it wouldn't just be a case of to Pep Guardiola, why didn't you play Pep, why didn't you play Kyle Walker in a back three? It would be, look, you could see this wasn't working after 36 minutes. Why didn't you shift Kyle Walker from a back three into a right back and go with a conventional back four? And you go, I'd be like, hang on a second, that's, gee. That, and then the next question would be, you know, your substitution that you brought on, you know, you'd, you'd probably ask Pep Guardiola the question, um, well, what was the thinking behind the substitution of um, Kyle Walker for Laporte? You know, you'd ask him the question and he would say, well, OK, I, I think it was because of this. And he'd give you some sort of what would be bland answer probably that, you know. However, in Spain, it would be, it would be, it would be completely different. It, it would be... You know, that was a ridiculous substitution. Uh, that was, you know, that was a highly questionable substitution that you made by putting Kyle, Kyle Walker on instead of Laporte. Why didn't you put Bernardo Silva on? Uh, the crowd were asking for it. The, the media were asking for it. Everybody in the stadium could see it. It would be a, a lot more clinical. And maybe that was because they were going for me as well, because obviously... I was the stranger in town a little bit and I was young and I think they, they realised that they could potentially go for me a little bit more than some of the experienced managers. But there's no doubt some of the press conferences became brutal. I mean, the one after, uh, the one after say, for instance, games like against Bilbao where I lost or against Atletico Madrid or against Barcelona, the 7-0, obviously, and they were brutal press conferences where, you know, I'd walk out after and I'd sort of smirk to myself thinking... Phew, I tell you, I, I, that that is a it's a pretty severe grilling that I've just taken, and um, there was no forgiveness. That, and why would there be? There was no putting putting a, you know there was no fellow managers putting their arm around me saying you know, you'll get through this. It was you were on your own. In fact, I do remember Simeone. Um, we got beat at home two 0 off Atletico Madrid, and I remember them going one 0 up. 
Um, and we were in the game. In fact, it was nil-nil, I think, up to 60 minutes when we were in the game. And then they scored after 60 minutes or something like that. And then they scored later on. But I, when they scored the first goal, it, during that match, it was interesting because there, was, there, was, there were a couple of games that I felt as though I was up against coaches where I thought, I'm out of my league here. I am totally out of my league here. And it was Valverde who went on to manage Barcelona for Bilbao. He changed, he changed system three times inside the game and he was always one step in front of me. And I always felt like he was toying with me like a little, like a little puppet. You were, um, you, were, you were chasing smoke. Honestly, Jeff, I could feel it on the touchline. I thought, this is what inexperience feels like. And I remember being on the touchline against Atletico Madrid and I felt like Simeone was strangling me gently through the game. I felt like it was nil-nil up to 60 minutes. And I felt as though he put his hands around my neck after about five minutes. And he thought, do you know something? I'll just keep, you know, I will literally carry on with you and I'll, I'll just toy with you a little bit. But I'll, he, he was almost torturing me football-wise over 90 minutes. And at the end of the game, I went to shake his hand and he just stormed off past me down the tunnel. And I always thought... Can I swear on this podcast at this time? I think I think we know what you thought. You yeah, thought. I, I, I thought Jill I thought you absolute because I, I, to me respect is always at the end of a game. Whatever happens, you go and shake your your your, your opponent's hand or you shake your um, your fellow manager. And he stormed straight past me, and I, I, I thought you are one horrible so and so. You. Um, which obviously I admired in his teams when I'd watched them. I have admired in his team since. His team represent him. Uh, his bench is all over the place during the match. They're all at it. They're all shouting. They're all screaming. But it, it, I honestly felt that in two or three matches that I was well out of my depth in terms of I was up against coaches. Was there a spot, Gary, was there a possibility that the reason he did that was he was looking at you thinking, you know, and the way he played the, played the game. There you go, Gary Neville. Have some of that. How dare you think you can oh, just pitch oh. up here in La Liga, be a top-class coach, take all your ideas, your media career, and do one. He's, he's give I, you some of that. I think, look, whether he's like that anyway, I don't know. Um, or whether it's just something that, like you say, he thought, nah, I think I need to leave one on you here. I think you need a lesson. And after the game, I remember, you know, all these things that happened to me, um, there were other games that I remember like Real Betis away and that's when I knew that I, that's when I knew I was gone the moment the, the moment I knew that I was gone when, when you go from when you go from starting off as 4-3-3 I then went and played Villarreal away and I went to 5-3-2 and I don't even like the system I hate it I then went to 4-4-2 um with a, with a narrow midfield four about probably mid-February. And then I went to Real Betis away and I knew I was finished as I was doing the team talk probably, but I knew I was finished during the game if I wasn't sure during the team talk. I actually put two big men up front and I thought, let's go direct. Let's beat, let's beat, let's beat the press that they have. Let's go full on, get up behind it, let's go old fashioned, let's be awful, let's be aggressive, let's go messy, let's let's go and win tackles. And you know when you do that, you realise you've run out of ideas. And essentially you weren't prepared. And at that moment alone, I knew after that game that I had to be sacked. I knew that I was in trouble. I knew that this just was something that wasn't right for me at, you know, at this moment in time because I'd literally, I'd zigzagged around like I was on the waltzers for four months, changing systems, trying different things. And players just need that consistent message, that message of, and that, that, that direction of, I believe, believe in what we're doing, believe in the coaching sessions, believe in the processes that you're going through and the results will come eventually. If all of a sudden after three, four games, you change the team, you change the system, you honestly, you're all over the place. And it taught me a lot in terms of, um, it taught me a lot, and I think that's where there were these little sort of little messages. And I, I think against Real Betis was the one where I did the team talk, where I think uh, Alvaro Negredo came up to me in the morning of the game. We were away from home, and I got to a point where I could speak reasonable football Spanish. Um, I was learning. I say I was doing four lessons a week, and I was 
you know, I was really trying hard and I was, I always made sure that the, the team talks were in Spanish and I always made sure that our coaches meetings were in Spanish and I always wanted to immerse myself in the culture because I'd seen what had happened at United when the international players came over and we tried to immerse them in the sort of, your know, Mancunian culture straight away. You speak English in the dressing room, you do the things that we do. You basically make sure that you adhere to the sort of culture that we've created in this club. And all the players did that. And that's why we had a successful team that could be from sort of South America, Africa, Europe, Scandinavia, wherever, wherever it was in the world. We had a great spirit because everybody adhered to the culture and the spirit of, of the fact that they were in Manchester. And so before that game, Alvaro came up to me and said, Gary, we want you to drop your translator Put him, sit him down and we want you to do the team talk in Spanish and we'll help you through it and we know what you're going to say. All you have to do is get a couple of words out and we know what, where you're going with it. And part way through that team talk, I went to say, you know, I want you to play lots of passes and went to say one, two, three, but I said earn der <laughs> toi. And my French from school kicked in. <laughs> At which point they're looking at you and thinking, forget it, he's got no chance. And I remember, I, I remember looking at Alvaro on the front row, and to be fair, they were all laughing, the players, to be fair. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh. You're done. You, you've got to remember, you've got someone who, to be fair, has spoken on television for five years confidently, and then you stood up there in front of 22 players, trying to speak in a foreign language, one that you've only learnt for the last two months, and you've completely lost your confidence in yourself. You've completely drained yourself of every little bit of belief that you've ever had. And I remember around that time saying to Paco and to Phil, and Phil was, and you know something, I don't think Phil's ever spoken the truth about this. Phil became incredibly frustrated with me out in Valencia because he'd seen someone who'd been relatively strong and resilient and robust throughout the whole life breaking down in front of him in terms of the principles of that I allowed, allowing other people to take the lead, allowing other people to do things, not not really standing up there and being front and central and saying, no, I'm taking the coaching sessions, I'm doing it. Everybody else moved to one side. And I remember saying to Paco and Phil one day, I'm, I, there was a point whereby the training was probably stood still for about three or four minutes. And it was stood still for three or four minutes because I was trying to get a message to one player that was asking me questions back. And you've got to remember, if I answer for what, if I answer a question for 30 seconds, it then takes 30 seconds to translate. He then comes back. So you're just doubling everything up. And it was so frustrating for me, let alone for the players. And I remember coming off the side of the pitch and it had been stood and the players were messing around. Some were jogging on the spot, some were kicking balls, some were talking because I was dealing with one or two players. And I remember coming off the side of the pitch and saying... Phil, Paco, I want you to... Phil had been out there for about eight, nine months and spoke a lot more fl Spanish and Paco was fluent, obviously, in Spanish. He's Spanish. So I just said to them, that's it. Do all the sessions from now on. Uh, I'm not stopping the players. I would have hated this as a player myself. And at that point, I lost the confidence to stand out on the training pitch in the middle of the training sessions and actually communicate with the players as well. So you've got to imagine that I've gone from this person who'd entered into Spain, who'd come over, who was sure of himself, who obviously was confident, to two or three months later, it, it essentially dismantled me um, piece by piece. And I always retained my composure. I never lost my temper. I never lost, uh, I never, uh, I never sort of started snapping. I, mean, I think a couple of times at half time, I think I lost my temper with the players because I felt as though there were moments where they, they weren't. It's one of the things that I learned from that session, from that, from that experience, sorry, that when maybe fans sometimes and maybe when us in the media look at a group of players and we think, oh, they're not, they're not doing all they can for the club, they don't care. Do you know sometimes they're just lost, they just haven't got any direction, they just haven't lost the, they've lost their confidence, they've lost their belief, they've lost their love of football momentarily because the, team, because the pressure is so much. And that's what made me see things differently. Um, I don't think the players ever gave in in Valencia. They never once give less than 100%. But all there were times whereby they were questioned for that, but they, I could never question them for that. They just didn't have the right coach for them at that moment in time at all, really. What effect do you think the whole experience had on you, short, medium and long term? Uh, in the sh do, do you know something? I, once... 
I was, um, so once I was sacked, I have to say that because of my experiences I had when I was younger in football, when I lost my confidence around the age of 23, 24 and around the world, uh, the European Championships in 2000 and, and giving the goal against Vasco da Gama uh, the season after the treble, I lost my confidence for about eight months. And I learned coping mechanisms and strategies to be able to deal with losing my confidence in that time. And when I was in Valencia, my losing confidence in myself came out of the fact that I'd never been there before. So once I got back into England and I decided that I was going to take a two month break to the end of the season, I wasn't going to go back on television for that two months. It was right to take that break. But I recovered really quickly. Um, I realised that ultimately I was more experienced as a pundit than I had been before I actually went to Valencia. I had more experience. I'd lived through the... Did you, were, you, were, you wor were you worried that your credibility as a pundit would have been damaged? No, I mean, still to this day, people will refer to Valencia. But actually, like I say, you know, if you remember before I went to Valencia, people quite often would say that, you know, I'm a really good pundit uh, because of the fact that I could articulate what was happening in a football match. And I still can articulate what would happen in a football match. Um, when I come back from Valencia, I've actually got more experience in football than I had before I went. So in essence, I feel as though I'm a more rounded pundit, particularly now being an owner of a football club as well and seeing it from that side. I feel as though I've seen it from the playing side, the owner's side, the coaching side, the head coaching side, um, obviously from a media side. And I feel far more rounded in able to being able to describe the game. I'm a lot less cutting than I was seven or eight years ago um, in, in terms of my punditry, I think. I'm a lot more forgiving. Uh, I'm a lot more rounded in terms of understanding sometimes the challenges that um, of an owner. I'm still obviously have to be critical at times because there's sometimes that there are some things that I still can't forgive, whether it be that I failed as a coach or I was a successful player uh, or a not a successful player. Sometimes the case may have been, uh, but when I came back in the short term, I recovered really quickly. Where it's helped me most, and without a shadow of a doubt, had the biggest impact upon me is in the decisions that I make moving forward in respect of, say, like, let's say, this, these last few weeks. Um, I see trouble coming quickly now. If I see trouble, I act quickly. I'm decisive. That's why I was critical of the Premier League in, this, in, in when they announced that they were going to continue with the, uh, continue with the, the weekend of fixtures when, when the rest of the world was shutting down and it was obvious that there was a major crisis looming and that something bad was happening, I felt there was enough intelligence, enough uh, information out there to be able to make the, a strong decision. And I always think now that when I look at Valencia as my experience of being weak and not making strong decisions, I think that ultimately now I always look at situations and think, right, what... If you're in a position whereby you're in, you're in charge of a business or you're in charge of a league or you're in charge of a football club or whatever it might be, in charge of a family or in charge of a, you're the leader in a family or you're the leader in a, uh, uh, whatever it might be, you've got to be decisive. You've got to be clinical in your decision making. And the biggest thing that Valencia taught me was that if you mess around with decisions, if, you, if you're weak, if you're inconsistent by changing systems and changing tactics, and that's why I've been a little bit vocal against Boris in the last few weeks. Because if you think about on the third of March, he publicly went into a he publicly went into a into the country and said that he wanted to uh, he was shaking hands with coronavirus patients, which was reckless at the time. And three weeks later, he's obviously asking us all to lock down. So inconsistency of message and lack of clarity in message is dangerous. And I found that in Valencia more than ever. That's why I now look at leaders and think I want clarity, I want consistency, and I want really decisive actions. And, and, and ultimately, I wasn't decisive in Valencia. I was really poor around that type of thing. OK, to, to wrap up on Valencia then... Even though you, you, you admit it, a, a long list of things that you got wrong, is there still part of you who's glad that you did it and what it taught you? Jeff, do you know something? The only thing that I think about Valencia is one... Well, sorry, there are a couple of things that I think about Valencia. One is that I was disappointed that I couldn't do the job that I wanted to for Peter, which was... Uh, stabilise the, the the team, stabilise the club and get him to the end of the season because he'd, he'd, he'd shown great faith in me um, and I wanted to repay him and I wanted to do the, I wanted to do a good job for him. So that was my first and, and biggest 
um, sort of disappointment. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a given. He, he, he's um, your partner and he's your friend. That's a given. But it, it came a great, it came a personal cost to you in terms of your confidence, um, your reputation to a degree, all of those things. But where we are now, four years on, is there a part of you that can honestly say, even though you, you, you're self-critical of it, you're still glad that it happened? Oh, Jeff, do you know something? I loved being over there. I loved the challenge. I loved the city. I loved the fact that I took the plunge to actually go abroad and go to Spain and take my family there and go for it and try it. The worst thing for me would be looking back and not having done it and thinking, do you know something? You bottled it. You didn't go. You didn't go. You didn't help your friend out. You didn't try to help your partner out. The person who wanted you and you didn't. You said so. What I said at the beginning was that no is a very important word sometimes. Um, however, also sometimes you've got to have the you know you've got to go and do things and you've got to step up and you might not be qualified and I did that and I made the decision. So I, I I'm 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 torn between the thought of. I had to do it because it was the right thing to do because I needed to support Peter and I wanted to help him. And, and, and uh, you know, I'd sat on television for five years telling everybody how English coaches didn't get a chance and the idea that I got a chance, however fortunate I was to get a chance through connections, I didn't take the job. You know, it's almost like a bottle merchant, really, if you, do, if you don't go and take it. So from that point of view, I ultimately don't regret doing what I did because I did it for the reasons that still stand true today. Uh, but I made a series of decisions that were weak decisions that weren't that weren't right. Don't regret it. Don't regret that you did it, but you regret the way you did it. Yeah, I regret the way I did it. I regret the fact that ultimately what I should have known when I went over there was that I was out of my depth, that I was out of my league, that I was out of my country, that I was out of the language that I spoke, and I didn't adapt to be able to cope with all those things that I knew that were there when I went over there. I didn't prepare myself, and to be fair. That's probably because I had two days to think about it partly, but also because I didn't react in a crisis, which was, you know, the club were in crisis, they sacked a manager. I should have taken it as a crisis situation and dealt with it in a crisis fashion. I went in there thinking, right, I can set up the club structure. I can set up the club's systems in terms of... Um, uh, that you know, was, that was your, 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 your biggest mistake was not taking me as the press officer. I could have smoothed it all over, talk them round, would have been fine. Results. Have me a bag of tail. It'll be all right. Don't worry. It'll be fine. I think that's Jeff, where you got it wrong. Jeff, I'm not sure the Spanish would have taken to you, to be honest with you, honestly. I... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the one, the one thing, the one thing, the one thing they kept asking me in the first month, and I didn't get it until I came back, is um, what she, they kept saying, what's your football idea? And I never got it. And I, I kept saying to them, what do you mean my football idea? And they said, what's your football idea? And I said, well, I want to win matches. No, 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 what's your idea? And I kept thinking, I, I asked, yeah. And they kept, it was obviously the philosophy, the values. And, I, and, I, and eventually when I understood where they were going with it, I said, well, look, if we're playing against a team that's um, brilliant in possession, we'll play one way. If we're playing against a team that's a little bit more direct, like Atletico Madrid, we'll play a different way. Because that's how we were at United. But I lost the fact that now players, the media, and managers, when they go into a job, they've got to sell the story of what they're going to do, the idea that they have for the team. And just going in and saying, I'm here to get results, you've got a clean slate, you know, we'll adapt to different games... It isn't good enough anymore. It's not, but, but it's not good enough for the media. It's not good enough for the fans. And it's not good enough, most importantly, for the players. Because the players, in the first two weeks of you being there, they want to know the idea that you've got behind how you're going to win games. And the one big thing that... Um, I should have spoken more to Roy, Roy Hodgson. Um, because one of the things that I did when I got there, they've been conceding goals, uh, Valencia... I worked a lot on defensive work for the first two or three weeks to try and get the defence right. And Roy said to me that if he'd have spoken to me before you went, Gary, and sort of talk, I did speak to him, but not through the detail of my coaching sessions. He said, the first principles you should work on are the attacking principles. He said, make sure the players in the first few weeks understand how you're going to make them win games. And I think back to Sir Alex's training, 99% of it was always around how we were going to win the game. 
not how we were going to stop the opposition. And I think ultimately, even the structure of how I went in there from the training sessions in terms of what I worked on initially and the idea that I had, I couldn't actually define my idea. I couldn't define the thing that was going to underpin what the players were going to say when they went out to speak about what Gary was like as a coach. So I couldn't give them a definite idea that they would all come behind. And I suppose, again, that comes back to leadership, that when you go, in, when you go into a company or you go into a business or you go into a situation, the first thing you have to do is grab the attention of the people that you're working with and say, right, this is what we're going to do. This is the idea that I have and this is how we're going to achieve it. And again, I just went in there and really didn't grasp with the players what, what we're going to do. Last question. You've said repeatedly uh, you have no intention of becoming a football manager. You're not going to become a coach or a manager. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen again. I just, I suspect, I could well be wrong, that there's part of you, all those things you learned at Valencia, all the errors that you made, all the things that you can't put right at Valencia now, there may well be an opportunity down the line where I don't know if it's about proving other people right or proving yourself right, where you say, well, actually, given what I learned there, yeah, I think I, I think I would like to try and put that right. Different club, different country, different scenario. But Look, but Jeff, part I mean, of you... uh, the, the reason that I can say quite categorically that it will never happen is because... To be a football coach, I think there's a number of things. Firstly, to be a football coach and manager, you've got to wake up thinking about it every minute of your life or else how can you think that all of a sudden I can think, right, I'm going to be a football coach tomorrow. There are people who think about this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they become, even some of those that think about it 24 hours, seven days a week, struggle to become a coach and a manager at the highest level or even at a lower level. So the idea that I could just rock up and basically be a coach for a Premier League team or a League Two team or a National League no, no, team no. tomorrow. No, 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 I'm not like that. But, you, but if you want, you, you could prepare. I think, I think no. ultimately, the, 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 the ideal scenario, well, the, the dream scenario for me is you become the manager of Salford. Because you're, <laughs> cause you're, cause you're, cause you're, cause you're the owner of Salford as well. And one of the owners of Salford. And I'd like to see you having a word with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Call yourself into the boardroom. For yeah, a chat. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, it, yeah. Well, the, the first type of the reason it's going to happen is because I, I I don't work hard enough at it, and you've got to be committed to something to do well at it. The second thing is that every single day of my life, Jeff, I'm 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 other than the weekends where I work obviously with Sky, I am in my businesses every single day for five days. So Salford, the hotels, and the and the development side of things, and I live and breathe those things every minute of every single day, and think about those things. And they're the things that I want to do. So for me, the the business of sport, I love. So Salford, I absolutely love. So where I can use my Valencia experiences is when we do have our meetings with, say, the the football, the, the, the coaching staff, with Graham and his team, with uh, with Chris, who's a sporting director, or with the, you know, I can really use my experiences that I've gained from England, working with Roy and with Sir Alex and with, and with obviously, the Valencia experience to try and give really good input and feedback to... Uh, to say Graham on occasions where he needs it, and I only speak to Graham probably once every two, three, four weeks. I don't speak to him weekly. I, I really do try. You know, he, he gets on with the job of coaching the team. But what I really am passionate about is sport and business, and um, I work in that every single day, both of them. And that's where my passion is in the future. My passion, I don't want to be on a training pitch coaching players. I genuinely don't want to be there. I want to be. Come here. Come here. Here we go. Who's so, 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 it, Sophie? It, it's Sophie. Come here. Here we go. Oh. So come here. So he this. Can't hear me, Gary. Don't forget. Oh, he's, 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 asking, he's asking me about Valencia. Have you got any experiences of Valencia that you can remember? Yeah. You did. Yeah, I was alright. Um, what, 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 like? what didn't you like? The school. The school. She didn't like the school because the breaks were two hours. They had like a break for two hours in the lunch times and they got, obviously they didn't yeah. have any fret. A siesta, yeah, but that, that, that wasn't quite well. Oh, and they served, what did they serve? Lentils. Lentils for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think she's a very good judge. I think she's a very good judge. Gadget the weather was better though. Yeah. <laughs> 
been great to talk to you off script and no doubt um, all this will continue quite a bit in the coming months but as we say to everybody right now you and your family stay safe and stay sane thank Cheers, you pal. thank you bye bye bye